Corner Club. Greetings, everybody. Um, we'd like to start with some housekeeping really quickly. Um, let me actually just change the screen for you here. So first off, this uh, um, talk is gonna be recorded. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, feel free to keep your camera off. Um, it's gonna be about a 45 minute talk followed by a Q and A. And if you'd like to see the talk in the future, we're all gonna be putting up the recording on our website. You can follow our social media to find out about that. Um, and with that out of the way, it's a great pleasure to invite you to, to, excuse me, I'm having a day. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the last chance evil talk of 2020. And as Pedos, we will be continuing this series in the spring, along with some other exciting projects we are currently developing. So please stay tuned. And with that, I'd like to hand things over to my colleague and friend, Nick Travellini, who's been the powerhouse behind this um, speaker series. And he's going to be introducing tonight's speaker. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And Nick, you can take it away. Great. Thanks, Colin. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out uh, to this Transceiver series uh, talk. Uh, we are so fortunate to welcome uh, Ayodamola uh, Tano, uh, excuse me, uh, Tanimowo Okonsiende, uh, or Ayo, uh, to the Transceiver series. Uh, Ayo is an artist, designer, educator, and time traveler uh, living and working in New York City. Uh, his work ranges from speculative design to physically interactive works, wearables, and explorations of reclamation. Uh, he teaches at the New School, specifically at the Parsons School of Design, and is also a student at the New School for Social Research in the Anthropology Department. Uh, tonight, Io will help us think about culinary temporalities and explore our relations with food and culture as we develop into a planetary and post-planetary future. Thanks again for coming. And with that, I'll turn it over to Io. Uh, Io, you're, you're currently muted. All right. Oh, okay, this is not the project. This is a, that's a secret project there. Okay. Um, Yes, 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 yes. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I see some folks in the um, in the grid that I'm familiar with, so I'm excited about that. And so I, I want to I want to start by talking about where I've been. I've I've lived in several countries. Um, I've traveled to I think 45 countries so far. And I bring this up because that's part of what informs me about uh, my practice, but also what informs me about the way I think about food and about um, my culinary practice. I have a multimedia company um, that we do these small design projects. Um, then we do sort of medium sized ones as well. And we do these large projects as well. And all of this is co all commercial stuff that we do for, for other artists. We build um, these things for other artists. We build this in this process, um, the design process of thinking of, you know, the problem, come ideating, and then from there, you know, developing a prototype, um, testing it out, iterating, and going through this. And it's a great process, especially for things that are really, really practical, right? Things that you could really handle. But the way that I work, you know, is I try to think about problems that are beyond that. Uh, these are called weak, wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that are so big that by the time you try to implement a solution, the problem itself changes, right? So there is no way to reason about what that problem is. So if you think about um, um, pollution, if you think about overpopulation, think about racism as well, right? Um, climate change, all of these problems are wicked problems that are so big. You could throw as much money as you want at it and you know the practical solution may not be the answer. So the question is, what do we do when that, uh, when we, when we come up against these wicked problems. 
and we need to start thinking about this because in the in the world that we live now, you know, we're basically destroying the environment. Um, we're thinking about, you know, colonizing spaces, um, um, going to Mars, going to outer space, and these problems are not <laughs> wicked problems are not just going to disappear. They're going to follow us wherever we we go. So we have to think about how do we address wicked problems. One way that I like to think about this is through speculative design, thinking about futures that are probable, well, futures that are most likely to happen, thinking also about futures that are, are, are plausible and futures that are, are, are probable, and then trying to change the direction of the future into something that's preferable. So this is, one could think about it as jumping into the future, finding a problem, designing a solution for that, and bringing that to the present as a way to critique the present, or doing this with the past as well, um, sort of reformulating the past to try to make a critique on the present, and in so doing, sort of change the trajectory of the future, right? But it's not only on a temporal uh, um, line on this sort of linear um, temporal line it's also in terms of think about dimensions spiritual dimensions geographic dimensions um so for me i i think about not only the temporality right but also the di the different dimensions that are within each of these temporalities and then the final part of that for me is sort of eschewing the idea of the linear timeline and thinking about time as something that could be a spiral, something that could be a singularity, um, jump, jumping back and forth. A lot of this is informed too by my, my Yoruba upbringing and Yoruba culture, where one could use devices as ways to jump between time spaces or jump between spiritual spaces. So as a result of this, uh, my, my work tends to be about creating these communities that you could transmit data back and forth. Um, so this is a piece called Little Juju that I did with Weena Lin that allows you to form, it's almost like a physical like button, uh, Facebook like button, where your community members have these devices and then you could rub on it and it signals anybody in the world that has this, this device as a way of sort of keeping community. But also thinking about how we not only work with human communities, but also work with non-human species, um, alien ontologies, I like to call it. So here's a, a piece on the Slime Tech Lab, which is a mobile laboratory to investigate slime mold and working with slime mold to, to make stories. Um, and this project is with Ashley Lewis and part of this project and a, a lot of all the work that I do is participatory as well and it's collaborative. So it's not only about trying to learn, right, but also teaching um, folks how to use the technology, how to think in the ways that we think um, in, in, in terms of speculative design. And then also there's a Yapa repository which posits a future museum African Museum that collects artifacts from their past, which is our future. So by understanding those artifacts of the future, we understand the cultures of that of that future. So a lot of this is about how we tell stories, right? Um, as Donna Haraway says, right, what stories do we tell and whose world is it? Um, and for me, it's also a little bit about alienation. Um, and what I mean by this is that by, for me, by alienating myself, I, I get a sense of, I get a different perspective, right? I, I learn in a sense from being, from making myself the other, right? Um, and not only, how, how could I say this? So by this piece is called the rift where I come as an as an African astronaut from the future. I walk around different cities and I interact with 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 people. So by alienating myself, I allow others to see me as something different 
right? Um, to, to encounter a different understanding of, of future possibility, right? And one of the things that is really important in the projects that I, that I do is that they, they have to be encountered. Um, they are not just aesthetic pieces that sit um, on the wall. So this piece I've won different countries. Um, I've won it to jury duty as well. Um, and I walk around the city. I did not get picked for jury duty. Um, I walk around the city with it. And on this suit, I have different devices that allow me to breathe. So this one gives me oxygen. Um, and these, all these pieces are sort of technological and ma magical in the same sense. Um, I sort of blend that line between what it, I call it technology in terms of silicone, but also technology in terms of ritual. So blending the two of those um, together. I want to land on this piece because this now gets us into food. So this is a piece that in, in terms of the narrative, it's a, it's an animal and a plant hybrid. And I wear it when I go out on expeditions with the suit and it gives me water when the temperature hits some uh, a particular um, temperature. And then it also gives me food. And it, um, it's sort of from the back. Oh, actually I have, oh, here we go. Um, I have some servos in it. Um, that release pellets of yam and also squirts water into my mouth at certain intervals. For me, yam is really important. And any Yoruba person will tell you that yam is an amazing, amazing um, product of Nigeria. And they believe that the reason that the Yorubas have the highest rate of twins is because something to do with the yams. But in a lot of um, Yoruba stories, thinking about Chini Ochebi, things fall apart. Yam is featured heavily there. So this is the type of yam that I'm talking about. So when, when we say yam, I'm not talking about a sweet potato, right? Uh, these yams are gigantic, humongous yams. And you could have them with, you could boil them and have them with eggs. You could um, deep fry them, have them with some stew. Um, you could roast them, have them with, um, have them with fish for breakfast, right? But traditionally, the and this is the way that I like to have it, right, is you pound it. Um, so this is a mortar and pestle that you then put the boiled yam pieces into it and you pound it and then you make a paste. This paste comes out as the, the paste that's on the left over here. Um, and then you take your hand, scoop it, dip it in and, um, and, and um, eat some sauce with it. My father, when he came to, um, to America, did not have access to these yams. And as a result of that, he had, he, he, him and his um, colleagues had to go and figure out how to make those, how to make that paste, right? So they tried bisquick, they mixed bisquick with cream of wheat, semolina, anything that would, that would do. Um, nowadays, you have actually instant pounded yam. But I bring this up to talk about the idea of authenticity. Because for them, for that um, um, cohort of um, African students that were doing their PhD, um, it became tradition for them to use bisquick or to use um, cream of wheat to make, um, to make their food. So this idea of food and the memory of what it means, you know, it changes over time. What does it mean for my father to be eaten pounded um, uh, mashed potatoes instead of yam, right? Does it change the way he thinks about himself? Does, he does it change the way he thinks about community, right? What does it mean for me now to have access to instant um, or instant pounded yam? Does that give me a connection to my to to my homeland, right? Um, am I perceived as being um, not being traditional enough if I don't make it the traditional way? And a lot of this um, comes in, into the, these ideas of cultural appropriation with food. 
and what is what is right to do with food. This, you know, thinking about culture as this um, as the politics of exclusion, right? That if you don't do, if you don't eat a particular way, if you don't make something a particular way, it's not authentic as a way to sort of exclude, right? But in actuality, that is not the case because the I'm I'm sure hundreds of years ago in Nigeria, you know, there were innovations that happened with the way one pounds yam, with the way one eats yam. So when I think about the food that I um, um, the food that I make, I think about it as a device, a temporal device that allows me to think about time, right? That allows me to think about my ancestors, that allows me to think about um, um, folks in the future. And it becomes this bridge that connects, right? So thinking a, a, a little bit about, um, about Elaine Gann, for example, and um, their work on rice and thinking about rice as the temporality of rice as this time machine, right? Mm -hmm. So I make these Nigerian dishes now that are fusion. Uh, I take flavors from different parts of the world and I mix them together. And I try to understand what it means to mix these flavors together. Um, we have here pounded yam with a stew and okra, which again, I'm doing another project with okra that is uh, it's an amazing and ama amazing, well-beloved um, um, vegetable for Nigerians. And then on the end over here, we have spinach with goat meat and, uh, and currants. My grandmother would not eat any of this, right? Because this is not traditional food. But when we think about traveling, right when we think about moving off planet we also have to think about when we blend these foods together what does it what memories that do they precipitate what memories do they uh, exclude um, how can we imbue memory into the food um, themselves so in an attempt to understand this i've been teaching courses um, a lot of them revolving around Octavia Butler um, and a lot of students making projects about food. Um, so here's a, a piece about the tomato and, um, and colonial powers in tomato, sugar and, and health. And here's Alonzo Castro's piece about smelling food in the future and also mangoes and memory, right? Um, and thinking of also about what does it mean to eat a mango, for example, if you've never had one before, you know, if you're on a spaceship going somewhere and you have these packets, oh, great example, the flavor of bananas, um, right? The, the banana, banana flavoring, nothing like the taste of a banana, right? But it's it's so it's so well connected to that um, to that idea. So thinking about how do we remember food, right? So I'm going to run through some precedents or some inspirations of mine, and then I'm going to talk about some some projects. Um, here is I take photographs of all the food that I eat on airplanes. I love airplane food. Space food, obviously, um, NASA does a great job. Um, of course, molecular gastronomy and a lot of art projects um, that I've been involved with that involve food as well. The, so there is a, there's the speculative side, but there's also the sort of practical side. And in some projects, I jump between the two with respect to food. This project is a speculative project, but it actually can be um, made and we, we are actually making it. And it, it, it's about food insecurity, you know, especially thinking about the pandemic now and the way that that's disrupted um, the, the food chain. So this piece allows you to place these beacons around areas that food can be harvested. And then, it has a 
beacon that alerts and you could get on it with your with your phone and it alerts you to what type of foods are in the area and when you harvest it you could then indicate that you've harvested it it also records um, the the soil moisture and air quality and the idea behind it is that you could create this network of beacons that would allow for people to forage when there when there's food scarcity this one is about memory um, and thinking about food as not something that you eat but food as a community so redefining what it means to have a great meal it's not about oh you know this recipe or um this taste but it's really about the ambiance it's really about who was able to make that meal the what what happened before what happened after so it's trying to capture the memory of a meal archive it and hopefully at some point sort of retrieve it so that when you say oh i had this great meal right it's not just about okay what did you taste so with this project we were on the the swale um barge and we asked participants to collect foods record them we got a lot of kids which was really amazing um record them either visually or audio in terms of audio video and then we made these memory maps of them and attached them to the recordings and we still haven't figured out a way of retrieving this you know obviously it's a lot more complex than just um make talking about food and drawing things and recording things and we're hoping that some time in the future we're going to have maybe do a, a different iteration of this project where we try to get even more, I guess, I don't want to say more authentic, but, but a more accurate understanding of the memory of a great meal. Some of the methods that I use are um, molecular, uh, molecular gastronomy, as I've um, stated before, here making some pearl, um, I think th these are blueberries, and then eggs made out of tomatoes, um, arugula, um, and this was really delicious. And then also thinking about how do we start, do these re records of trying to preserve food by dehydrating them or just letting them sit and just observing how they, how they go bad. Um, dehydrating foods, and uh, thinking also about packaging, how do you vacuum seal packaging? So these are all experiments in the kitchen that Alonzo Castro and I have been working on with two projects that I'm gonna show um, later. And then thinking about the packaging as being packages for, for space travel. Um, so join up these um, devices that you push a button, it cuts it open, or it heats it up by um, with a battery, or it cools it down, right? Um, also, how could you put multiple things into a package at the same time? So if, for example, you want rice and beans, you could just squeeze the rice and beans part. If you want rice and sauce, you could squeeze the sauce part. So a lot of this, a lot of these contraptions we've, um, we've tried building. Here is a really rudimentary one where we have dry cassava and water in sealed bags that with Ziploc <laughs> cut off. So you push it, it breaks the, the seal and um, hydrates the, the yam. And then from that, you then place that onto a heater and then it heats it up and then you cut it and eat it. And here we have some okra and some, some beef that have been dehydrated and vacuum sealed as well. And I don't know if you all remember the, so a few slides ago, I showed the pounded yam with the, with the sauce and I talked about okra being really essential in Nigerian cooking. So this is a piece for an African astronaut um, that would have pounded yam a red sauce and uh, an okra sauce. And if you look really carefully, you'll see within them 
there are these two tabs that you could push and break the inner seal and it will allow the contents to flow up into the outer seal. So basically you take this, put it in hot water and then break the seal, cut it open and eat. Really handy. And so this, uh, and then also thinking about how, how we do packaging as well. And then <laughs> thinking, how do we then mechanize all of this? So, so moving forward, we've been experimenting with how is it possible to print the, the yam starch itself using a 3D printer? So we've been working with a chef to try to get the consistency right, um, using different techniques of mixing agar and keeping notes. Uh, you see the chef's notebook up there. Chefs really love to keep notes. I was really impressed. Um, and here's an example of a, a quick test of, yes, we can actually print yam. So we printed yam, printed the shell of the yam, and then inside of it, then print the, the, the sauce, the okra sauce and the, and the red sauce. And here we have the printer. On the left, you see the three tubes that go in. Um, we had to hijack this printer and change the G code and um, create our own uh, extruders for this. We're in the process of building another 3D printer for food. We've learned a lot from this um, process. So the two projects that have come out of this are the Expelled, which is a, a piece that sort of came out as a result of Trump being president, where we speculate on a, a future world where he somehow manages to get all the immigrants off planet. And so as the immigrants are, are, are being escorted off planet, they have to think about how do they preserve their food? How do they take their food with them? So we made Peruvian food and Nigerian food in the processes that I showed earlier. Um, and try to preserve them um, and try to develop ways to then rehydrate them or heat them up, keep everything food safe, right? Um, and these are some of the outcomes here. Uh, we have the okra, obviously, we have the red sauce, we have some jerky, pounded yam, um, we have a Peruvian um, um, soup in the middle. When we present this, um, well, I'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, we also have this sort of jerky that has um, a spinach as well in it. And then we have a rice and beans that we dehydrate and vacuum seal. And then we have a device that we try to then grind the rice and beans and then rehydrate it for consumption. When we present these, um, this was at the space conference at MIT beyond the cradle. Um, a lot of times because it's food, you know, the, 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 the institution doesn't want anybody to taste it because they are fearful that it's not food safe. In the back, oh, you can't see it here. We bring our own sous vide, right, um, machine. So we put everything in, um, keep things at a, 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 at a good temperature. But we find that people are really, really, really experimental. They will eat anything. Um, so in the process of making all of this, we've learned a lot about making sure that we're um, spraying, clean, keep, keep, keeping our hands clean, using gloves, you know, using a proper kitchen, right? Uh, so this project, this other project is provisions where this project is all, is all about African food, Nigerian food. Um, and again, here we have gari and we have um, chips of okra and spinach. Uh, and again, this is about an African astronaut traveling into space, wanting to remember home, wanting to reconnect to home. And how do we make food for those astronauts? I, I always think about that, um, about what it means to be in space, to be so far away from home and not having a food 
that you really love, not having a food that your grandmother used to make, right? It must be really, really lonely to, to, to have that experience. And then beyond that, you know, not only about thinking about food that your grandmother used to make, but also thinking about the future generations. So this piece is about naming ceremony. Nigerians have, or Yorubas have a tradition that they will name a child several days after it's been born. And part of this naming ceremony involves using um, food ingredients like water, salt, honey, and uh, uh, allowing the child to taste the, um, these food ingredients. So here, instead of having these ingredients, a lot of them are, are liquid, instead of having them liquid, using tapioca st starch to um, encapsulate the, the encapsulate the flavors and the and the the tastes of the ingredients so you could think of a nigerian couple that has a child on one of these great travels to into into in, into stellar space and wanted to keep that ritual and so here's a, a perfect way of of doing that M my brother just had a a, a a boy unfortunately it was during the pandemic um, so we weren't, I wasn't able to test this out on a child yet. And of course, <laughs> of course, there's, you need water, right? So these pouches here are, they remind me of those, um, the sun kiss pouches. Uh, and you take the straw, poke it in, eat it. I mean, drink it, right? This is one of the prints of the that the machine created um, on its dying leg, but that did not prevent people from consuming it. So we do these performances where we ask people to come and then we, we eat with them, right? We tell them about the food, what it means, where it comes from, why we're doing these projects. And then we ask them to tell us about their stories and what we find is that a lot of these stories are the same. They're about grandmothers, they're about uncles, they're about childhood memories, right? Um, thinking about, they, they are Proustian um, Madelines that sort of transport you and then pull you back, you know, toss you back and forth in time. And when we do these, I'm always so, honored to have people tell me these stories you know to have people remember them and associate those memories with these new products that, that we're creating and associate that with the idea of existence in the future projecting one's identity into the future particularly people of color right and thinking about the lack of representation of people of color in projections of the future and what that means, right? The lack of the, the representation of food, of culture, and what that means about the existence of these people in the future, right? It denies their existence. And in denying their existence, it dehumanizes them. So in a way, the hope of, this, of these projects is that it gives agency to individuals to, to to project, to throw their identity into futures, you know, to jump to the past, to remember their ancestors and bring them along with, the, with them into the future, to think about the possibility of an existence, you know, beyond the, 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 the way society, American society creates this idea that the, the black and brown bodies are to be extinct, right? So when we talk about the future, when we talk about going off planet, I want us to think about food as not food. Food is not food. You know, it's not a material thing. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a discursive thing. It's something that you, it, it's made from, from community, it's made from history, it's made from memory, right? It's, it doesn't have a particular place in time, right? 
it, 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 it can move you around in spiral ways, right? It could pull the future and the past into the present, or it could take that and it could like disperse it across the universe. Um, so as we disperse across the universe, you know, the hope is that we take with us this idea of community, this idea of memory um, within the food and use food as these temporal devices. Thank you. How am I on time? Thank you. you I, that was perfect on time. We've got time for a Q&A here. So we'd like to open it up to participants. Um, quick reminder that this is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, feel free to put your question in the chat preceded by a queue so we can filter it out and we're happy to read those out for you. Or um, you can use the raise hand and we'll unmute mute you and let you ask your question. Well, people are working on questions. I know it can take a moment to formulate thoughts after this. Um, just want to thank you again, Io, for coming and speaking with us tonight. Um, I found that really incredible just now and a great ending to the speaker series for the semester. Yeah, I see Nick there. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I can't raise my hand as a co-host, so I'll <laughs> yeah, raise my no hand worries. visually. Um, <laughs> so yes, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. Um, I have so many questions, including what everyone's responses were at, when you showed up for jury duty. Um, and I think I'm going to not actually ask that one. And the first question I'd like to ask is uh, also in that same vein, uh, what's your favorite airplane meal that you've had? Um, and while you're doing that, I'm going to, while you're answering that, I'm going to make sure I formulate my second question yes. perfectly. Close your eyes, you're, you're on an airplane, you hear a jingle and it's the cart, it's the cart, you know it's a cart, but you're sort of half asleep. And then all of a sudden you hear chicken or fish, chicken or fish, right? Or, or, or vegetarian, you open your eyes and you handed this hot um, plate, right? You sit down, put it down, open it up, the steam releases and you smell it. And it's amazing. It's organized. It's so it's so organized. There's so much information in the way that it's is packaged. The fact that it has it goes through this process of you know coming from the farm, you know, being cooked in 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 ways that stabilize it, uh, making sure that it's 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 the right quantity, weighing everything out that it's nutritious, right? Um, you you're not going to get foods like durian, right? That are going to be overpowering. Right, so all of these considerations, um, and then so it speaks to it speaks to organization. It speaks to design, but for me, it also it reminds me because I travel so much. I, you know, it reminds me of 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 new adventures. You know, of new places that I that that I want to go. That you know, places that I've been that I. Yeah, the probably the best food that I've had was Nigerian food on the airplane. I, I can't remember what airline it was. It must have been Nigerian Airlines when it existed, um, which is a whole nother, you know, thing I'm working on. Um, yeah, but the 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 fact that you have this pounded yam and you know, and another great thing about uh, about food on airplane is that it it really. Um, well, I don't know as much now as before, but culturally, right? You see people eating food differently, right? Um, so for example, I saw somebody taking, um, um, I think it was jam and mixing it with something that wasn't necessarily supposed to be mixed with, but at the same time, it's like, of course, of course you do that, you're on an airplane, you know? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, that's great. And I guess my second question on a more, uh, I guess, serious vein, um, not that that wasn't a great response or great, uh, uh, great experience. Um, so when, as you're thinking about temporality and you talked about this at the very beginning and, and you, you close with it as well, 
your work really seeks to be untimely in a way. Um, it seems to me you want to, so there's the, the notion of the untimely that Nietzsche uses in his untimely meditations of something from the past coming forward and changing the present to affect the future. But you're adding an extra dimension to that because you're also trying to bring in the future to change the present, to make a different future than what you imagined. And yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. And do you think that that's a fair characterization of what you're trying to do with your work? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, and another aspect of it is this is the performative aspect, which or the interactive aspect. And by interactive, I mean, you know, these I, I think about the works that I do as temporal artifacts that then exist in our temporality, they encountered and then they throw the individual either past, present or, you know, spiral, right? Um, and I've been thinking about this thing now about the notion of recursive time where certain memories get trapped within the memories, within the memories, within the memories and what that means. And really uh, trying to figure out, are there other ways to think about time you know, in this way that is not about linear, linearity, that is not about the idea of progress, um, that is not about productivity, right? So, for example, the one of the pieces for Shannon's um, class that I'm doing is creating these clocks that deal with repetition as a way of marking time. So, for example, one piece calls the internet and looks for um, when black bodies have been killed by police, and then it indicates how many days have passed since the last one. Um, but it's not only this thing of, okay, it's been one day or two days or three days before we, we had a, 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 a previous injury, but even that counting itself is troubled in the piece because at times it, it, it refuses to indicate the day and instead it just does a glitch, right? So then the, the, the idea of the, the, that linear time of one day, right? Can then be crunched or expanded or, you know, yeah. And, and the, the, what I want is for all these pieces, right? Is for people to encounter them and by encountering them, start questioning their notion of the way we construct time. And a lot of this, um, um, you know, is, you know, a lot of folks are doing this stuff. The folks at um, Black Quantum Futurism, you know, work with time as well. Um, and been looking a lot about uh, at the way they do their mappings and so i've created this rubric of how one might think about deconstructing time right um and then create doing one's own mapping of time and then doing a doing a construction of time by creating artifacts and then doing an injection of time by taking those artifacts and injecting them into the physical space and because space and time are connected, that injection into physical space, when someone encounters it, it then bubbles back into a, a disruption of their temporality. Great, great, thank you. We've got a question here in the chat, so I'm just gonna read this out really quick for everybody. Um, it's from Swati. Swati. Sorry, I'm mispronouncing that. Excuse me. Um, Hi. Oh, if you're unmuting yourself, please feel free to read this out. Hi, I'm Swati. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm uh, uh, right now in Switzerland, in Zurich. And uh, I'm also doing my master's with the topic of commensality and intimacy and the future of eating together. So that's why I found your presentation extremely, extremely insightful. <laughs> and I just wanted to ask if, because you were just talking about interaction and temporality as well, have you also worked around the topic of intimacy when it comes to commensality? Yes, yes. Yeah. 
Um, so I don't know if you all know this, but I have another website um, I, that I'm going to put up. So one website is all about um, um, blackness, and the other website is has other projects that I do that relate to participation. So this project, I have a I have a performance group that addresses that. Um, it's called the Sacred Collective, um, and one of the pieces that we did. Let me actually share my screen. So the the Temple of Taste and Remembrance is a sacred collective project, but this was another piece that we did called O Sacra, and it blew my mind because at first we thought, okay, let's make this piece about fear, where we get people to speak their fears, right? And by speaking their fears, it goes into the microphone and then it changes the screen on the table. And then from that, we then read it as, sh uh, as shamans. And then we prescribe different ingredients, wrap it up in, um, in rice paper and we feed it to them. And we say that it's, it's gonna cleanse them, right? So we, we thought, okay, this is great, perfect. And let's do the performance. So we start doing the performance. We give it to, first of all, we do it in this darkened room, right? We have sound and light, and then people start talking about the death of their mother. You know, they start talking about their, you know, the fact that, you know, all, the, all their anxieties, they actually bring it out to us, right? And then when we give them the, 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 the piece to eat, they start crying and everybody started crying. And we did this several times, right? Um, and every, every time somebody will be crying. And then we realized, oh no, we, what have we done? You know, because we came into this as, oh, we're gonna do a performance piece, right? And now we are actually, now we actually have to be responsible, right? Now we actually have to take care you know, because people are opening up in these ways. And the fact that food allows one to do that, you know, especially when one does it in the sort of ritualistic way, right? It allows for that, that opening. And I think that that's part of when, when I talk about food not being a material thing, that is what I'm talking about is that it is that ability to open that space, that shared space, and that is that, that's where intimacy lies. So, you know, if we're talking about, oh, let's go into space, right? And we're just gonna take food and dry it, you know, whatever, and go into space and eat, that's not food. You know, how do we create a space whereby I trust you, you trust me, I invite you over for dinner and you know that I'm not gonna kill you, right? Uh, right? Uh, you know that I prepared the food with clean hands. You know that if you open up to me about something, a memory that you have with that food, that I could take that and I could hold that in care, right? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, as you talked about rituals and hygiene and trust, I mean, I've been also kind of playing around with these ideas, but yeah, thank you so much. It's very good that you've already put it together and you have already worked with it. And I'm glad that you would be putting this video up and will be will other people outside from New School will also have access to the video? Yes, absolutely. That'll be on the NSPDOS website. You can get that in the chat here in a minute so you can see all main website with the past talks as well. Just just a note, um, I remember um, because it's going out that this project um, with Sacra is with a friend of mine. We collaborate on it um, and and their name is Teresa Braun. Thanks great. a lot. Great, thank you. Thank you for that great question. Thank you. And response. <laughs> I have a question here in the chat from Ali. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you're welcome to, but if not, I'm just gonna, oh, there you are. Yeah, I don't mind. Um, hi, thank you for this fascinating talk. Um, uh, as someone who also works in a similar space, I was just curious like what you have encountered as um, 
maybe the greatest pitfall around current discourse around the future of food. I mean, there's a lot you suggested the lack of inclusivity, which might be the top one. Um, I also noticed a lot of technophilia. I'm really curious, like what you kind of feel about that. Yeah, I, for me, it's, it's partly about technophilia, right? But it's also partly about the idea of pro progress, uh, which of course ties into, ties back into time and productivity. Um, when we're, and, and this is a, about discourse on the, on the on future about, uh, especially about traveling uh, um, or going off planet, that we haven't been able to address problems here, you know, but science and technology and progress and in the future we will you know, make it so that we have, we could go anywhere and eat it. No, what about here, you know? So that's one of my, one of my pet peeves um, because if we think about time and we attach it to this idea of progress and it's all about futurity, right? And this is why I, I don't use the term Afrofuturist, uh, Afrofuturism with my work, I use the term reclamation because Afrofuturism presupposes that the future solves, right? Um, it, and it, it is about this sleekness and about this um, technophilia. Um, and, and that's another reason why for me, technology is not, um, is not just the silicone and iPhones, right? But it's also ritual, right? It's also divination. Um, it's also the way we we interact with each other, the words that we use, all of that is, is technology. In fact, I would say that those are technologies that work. Technologies that don't work, um, like the computer, um, the, the, the SpaceX shuttle, um, these are technologies that when they break down, it's so obvious, right? But, you know, people wear glasses, we're able to communicate, um, we understand rituals, right? We have this need for rituals and those work. Um, yeah, so in, in short, I think the answer to that question is, yeah, definitely inclusivity, um, definitely the, the idea of technophilia, but I would also attach to that, that idea of the notion of progress and time and that the idea of modernity or science being able to fix everything, which obviously is not the case. And maybe we need to rethink the idea, those ideas of progress and time and look at how we can solve some of those problems here first before we shoot them into the future. And a lot of times too, this idea of um, future is really, the desires of the present, right? Like the desires that we have of the present that we cannot accomplish, we always throw it to the future, you know? And that's not fair. Thank you, yeah, I think that, especially in food, I think we've proven that um, traditional ways of growing and um, communality and I mean, in, everything from indigenous practices to yeah food rituals um, have proven much more progressive and yet to treat the notion of progress as a linear arrow, we yeah. know that's not true about time. So why would it be yeah. true about progress? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and what really ticks me off, oh, oh, I get so angry when I think about this. I had in, in high school, uh, um, I, they had international day. Everybody was supposed to bring in their international foods. And I came in my Agbada and everything, right? I'm sitting there. I gave, put my food in front for everybody to have great food that my parents um, um, prepared. And I see somebody in the back, right? They ask, oh, could I see your hat? They take my hat, start sniffing it, right? Um, as if there's something wrong with it and start rejecting my food as if there's something as if there's something wrong with it. And it's part of this idea of progress that, you know, oh, it's not civilized, right? You, uh, the, the, he's backwards, right? Oh, he's African, he's, you know, and that really plays havoc on, on the way we think about food, uh, the way we think about what is, what is consumable, right? 
um, what is, yeah, yeah. Um, Nina, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know that it was still up. Um, I don't even know how to lower it. Oh, there we go. Sorry, um, can you hear me? Because sometimes my internet's weird in this room. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I was wondering if, um, thank, first of all, thank you so much. I feel like similarly to Nick that I have a million questions, but one that, so something that I wanted to ask, I, the whole time you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, I have, okay, so I'm just gonna say I have celiac disease. So gluten is poison for me. So I was thinking this whole time, like, you know, what about when the food itself is the source of alienation? And, um, but I feel like also your talk has given me like a really beautiful new metaphorical language for thinking about my condition because it's like, well, maybe I'm not, you know, this thing that's alien from everyone else, or maybe I'm, it's just that like, I'm an astronaut who can't come home because, because I can't, you know, my grandmother used to make me cream of wheat when I was a little kid and I can never ever eat that ever again because it will make me sick. Um, or, and I know that now I knew I didn't know at the time that it was making me sick and I know now as an adult um, but so I'm just curious to know um, you know in, in your experience of having people tasting and trying things have you had the opposite or problem where people have been like oh I would love to try this but you know because I've had situations where I, I deep there are people I deeply trust who have accidentally you know put some gluten in something and of course I'll hold it against them um because it's an accident um but so I, I I'm just curious to know like it looked like all of your labeling looked like I could eat okra yams all of that would be fine for me um I just I was interested to know yeah what what has your um encounter been with the allergen as yeah. a consequence um we so i don't we we i don't think we've encountered anybody that's been allergic to any of the food items we do have a list of the ingredients um that that we that we let people have so it could be that they see the ingredients and they're like okay no but they don't tell us right but th that is very interesting that idea of the memory being lost, right? Um, as a as a as a result of that food allergen, um, yeah, that's 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 troubling. It's, I wonder if there's a way that you can recreate that memory. If you could create a food, right, that through the through the eaten or the ritual of that food, right? It recreates that memory. So that memory then becomes attached to that new food product, right? Um, but I think part of that would be, the, the, yeah, because the, the food that you ate was, the memory was constructed with your grandmother, with, you know, and it was put into that food and you can't eat that food then you need to, in a way, try to recreate that environment with a new food to imbue that memory back in there. And then maybe it holds that memory, right? And then perhaps that, that, that process um, could then be shared with others as a way of the food and the process could be shared with others as a way of that suffer from the same allergen as a way of allowing them to access their own memory, right? Um, I, I, I had a food show in DC. Um, it was called Burn. Uh, I'll tell you all about it. it, it it's it, basically it's uh, you get, give two groups of people money. They go to the, um, they go to the farmer's market, buy something, and then they have to construct something based on a concept. Um, but during our taping, we spoke with Jose, Andre, Jose Andres, and he said something that was really fascinating, strange, very strange, but really fascinating. We asked him what the most delicious food that he's ever had was. And he said, you know, probably for all of us that we don't remember what that food is. Um, 
because that food is mother's milk, that if we remembered the taste of the mother's milk, we wouldn't eat anything else, right? That the memory, you know, is so intense in that, in the flavor, in the, you know, it's, it's so locked into that, that our body needs to reject that memory. It needs to, we need to re remove that memory. Otherwise we cannot consume anything else. So sort of thinking about this in terms of your, uh, that perhaps um, understanding the need to reject a memory, a food memory might help with the, with the construction of a food memory. Thank you. That was really interesting. I was just thinking as you were talking that I find that I can be connected to other people through the smells of the food. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and when people are like wanting to, are cooking and wanting to give me food, um, they can, you know, I can be like, I can smell it. And, um, oh, that's Christeva. That would be really interesting. Sorry, Nick, I just saw your comment. Um, but thank you so much for that answer. I'm, that, that I've, it's given me a lot to think about really really good talk thank you thank you i'm looking for other hands or comments from the audience um if anyone wants to please jump in um in the meantime i just wanted to ask a question of my own i was thinking io about you talked about the 3d printers that you were printing food with and I see Tanvi. Um, do you just want to jump in now and I can ask my question after? Yeah, sure. Hi, hi, it's so good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Um, so I guess my question was around uh, the plant aspect um, or the source aspect of the food. Um, personally, like when I saw okra, it's a okra is a like, large part of North Indian cuisine as well. And uh, it's such a shame because the okra that's grown in the United States tastes nothing like the okra that's grown back home. Um, and I was wondering like, if you gave any thought to like, what that would be like, just like produce um, and imagining like less processed, I guess, forms of um, food at all yeah um yeah so i i'm 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 doing a project with ashley lewis on on okra um and mainly looking at it as this vehicle of memory again right um but also thinking about the physicality of it and the trace um from africa to the americas you know think about seeds um in hair of enslaved um, folks, right? Thinking about, yeah, thinking about it as this, this wealth of memory. I, I don't know if, if, if it's true, that, well, I don't know, the, the flavor, of, I, I have a feeling that the flavor resides partly in the memory, right? Um, and if, for example, you have the okra that is grown here, that is not, you consider not as flavorful as back home, but you are able to construct a memory about that or a story about that. Let's say that, that that plot of land that you have, right? That you're growing it, right? It changes the flavor, right? Now imagine that those seeds that came, you know, that your grandmother, great grandmother brought those seeds along with them, right? Um, and this is where we're doing a fabulation right here, right? It's not that it actually happened. You are constructing this as a, as a memory test, right? As a flavor memory test. Is it possible to imbue that with, to, to use narrative to imbue flavor into 
of food? I don't know. I, I would like to think so. Um, because it's, it, 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 as, except if it's something that is not nutritious, right? I think there's, there's something, there's a difference between, you know, if it's not as nutritious, you know, yeah, there, there's a problem there. But I, I think perhaps flavor and texture and all of that too has something to do with, with memory. I think that's really interesting that you mention or like take note of the narrative as like such a pivotal kind of concept in terms of the flavor. Um, I personally used to have trouble kind of imagining why certain kids would not like, like frown upon like ethnic foods or like do not find the smell displeasing or whatever. And I feel like a lot of that is just the narrative. Like the smell doesn't yeah. really have anything to do with it. It, it, it's, 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 yeah, it's a lot of it is the narrative of like, oh, you're brown, oh, you're black, eh, no, you know, you're not as, you know, right? And which is, which is unfortunate because some of the, some foods are just amazing. What well, a lot. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Ayo. Yeah. But that's, that's a good project to try, uh, uh, Tanvi, is to, maybe construct something and try to project a memory or flavor into it, you know? I always think about when I go to, I, I went to this restaurant in Finland that, oh, the food was just so amazing, right? And then I'm thinking, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was just, I was in Finland, I was having fun with friends, you know? It, it's almost like, and try this, um, sometimes I do this, I'm thirsty, I see a water fountain. And then I imagine myself in the desert and I slowly just walk over to the water fountain as, oh, I'm in the desert, I'm in the desert. And then I drink it and I'm like, oh, wow. But no, it's just my mind playing tricks on me. Thank you. <laughs> Tanvi, I um, I'm actually, this is great because the question I was about to ask previously, I think can kind of roll off this. It adds an additional layer. Um, what I was going to ask was about, you talk about these 3D printers printing the food, um, but you mentioned in order to print the food, you had to reconstruct the uh, extruder heads of the 3D printer. You had to make your own heads. And it made me think that one way to do that is through 3D printing new heads. So you could use the machine to make its own future self. Yeah. Um, which is kind of a play with time as well. Um, but if you Go ahead. Go on. Yeah. Um, if you're doing that, my question would be is like, where is that taking you in your broader narrative? Yeah. Um, how can we expand that to think about food? And with Tanvi's question, thinking about land and plots of land or the soil that food is grown in, um, you know, how it's produced, what it's, how it's preserved, which you talked about. Um, and thinking about that kind of longer narrative when we think about going into space or, you know, travel, moving from one continent to another. Um, what is the, you know, stories of the seeds yeah. um, that you're discussing. So I'm thinking about that, but also on a technical side of like yeah. the machine recreating itself. Yeah, um, we're in a spaceship and we're gonna drink our water, right? And we drink the water and then you tell, somebody says, oh, that's urine water, right? Nobody wants to hear that. But is there a way that you could, is there a brand that you could use to, you know, brand urine water? Right, you know, how can you make that flavorful? You know, how can you talk about the notes that you get from that water as something of that speaks to the technological advancement of you? You know, but I think what you're talking about too is this idea of recursivity, um, sort of in the sense of using the printer to print, using the printer to print the nozzle to print the food, right? Um, or and this we do did this as well, modifying the food so that the printer can print it, right? Um, so, and then thinking about what does that mean to modify the food so the printer can print it? And what stories we have to tell ourselves 
about that. So when we when I ate the pounded yam and the you know um, that was printed by the printer, it was it tasted. So first we had to add agar, we had to stabilize it, we had all these things to do with it um, to the okra, right? Didn't taste anything like okra that I, my grandmother made. Same thing with the hot sauce. I mean, with the sauce. Same thing with the pounded yam. Nothing it tasted nothing like that. But in the construction of all of that, and uh, you know, then we print it, and then we eat what we printed. Then the the idea of what we've done, and how the process, you know, the research that went into it, you know, the testing that went in, into it, we're like, yeah, this is damn good, you know. Um, so I think part of it is about how do we um, think in, for example, regolith, right? Um, and, you know, okay, introducing microbes into regolith to then allow for soil to then grow plants, right? Um, maybe what we are introducing, maybe there's a story there, right? Maybe it comes from a particular place right, the, the microbes that we're using. Maybe we're creating a new terroir, right, you know, where sort of this area is, you know, Amazon bacteria, this area is, you know, some other bacteria and the foods that come out of it, you know, we brand them in, in, in particular ways. But there is this need to, to modify not only what we, not only how we eat, right, but also um, the f how the food is created to fit with whatever environment it needs to, to grow, right? So there's all the technology and, uh, um, and science that goes into that, but that still doesn't, th that's not gonna taste good if we don't have a way to, to talk about it in a way that connects to, to memory, to humanity, to community, right? It's just going to taste like, like a piece of cardboard, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see that in um, what you were talking about before with food as cultural appropriation and talking about fusion foods, uh, you have that same kind of remaking of the food to fit the situation yeah yeah and i don't you know like there's a, the idea of cultural appropriation with food i don't know if i don't know if i buy that you know i think a lot of foods are all foods are influenced by other foods you know if you're everything is influenced by everything um i would like to think that any sort of quote unquote appropriation Right, is being done not in an extractive way. It's being done as a way to experiment, as a way to honor. Right, then I stand by that. If it's done in an extractive manner, that's that becomes problematic. Yeah, and that's about the stories we tell. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How we recognize provenance, how we recognize the timeline of a food. Exactly. exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I think that. Uh, is a really great ending to that. That wraps things up fairly well. Um, thank you so much for all of us. I, if anyone in the chat does have a last one in question, happy to take it. Um, and if not, then thank you, Io. Um, I, I see Nick's throwing our website down in the chat if people want to follow up. Um, Mike, there are social media links there as well. And there's IO's website. So please follow up with everyone involved. You, you know, what I, what I really regret is that we couldn't have done this in person where we could taste the food, right? Um, and hopefully soon we'll be able to do something along those lines. Hopefully, we'll be happy to have you back for that as soon as that's a possibility. <laughs> This is a really fantastic talk. So, cool. All right, y'all, be safe and uh, yes. enjoy something good to eat. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how do I cook everyone out? <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording, actually.